Yes, it's six o'clock in the UK, one o'clock on the East Coast, whenever that is, wherever you are, and it's time for reality. It's time for the reality show, the show that now has a title and half a dozen great guests slash hosts. We've got to talk about this. We've got to talk about Trump and Biden because a recent poll says, well, if you held the election today, they're neck and neck. And we've got to talk about this poor gal, this vegan who's been telling everybody, eat vegan. And she dies of starvation. But the main topic, well, first, let me introduce our, uh, our, our guests, hosts for the show. What a lineup we've got today. Of course, the host of the most recent episode with Nicholas is Mark Pellegrino. Mark, how are you doing today? So far, so good, man. Good to see you. And Michael Leibowitz, podcaster himself with his own show. How are you doing on this fine Wednesday? I'm doing fantastic. Happy to be here. Excellent. And James Valiant, of course, you watched James and I give our show previously this morning. James, I assume you are still in good spirits. Just as fantastic as ever. <laughs> a long time to see, my brother. Yes, this is going to be good. Kirk Wilcox is with us as well. How are you doing today, Kirk? Fantastic. Glad to be here. And Last, but maybe most, or certainly not least, the great John Wass, the artist in residence. John, how are you doing today? Oh, very good. Thank you. Nice to see you again, Robert. Now, I gave you our topics, well, the second topic, the third topic, but the main topic of the day, California, California, USA, by some reports is in the midst of a worsening crime crisis. Reports of increasing smash and grab. You can watch these videos on YouTube. Now that there are security cameras and cell phone cameras everywhere, you can watch videos of just hoodlums smashing windows, grabbing stuff, walking into convenience stores and just walking out with stuff and security doesn't know what to do about them. I want to know from the panel, what do you make of all this? You know, Leonard Peikoff did a great lecture on the causes of crime and, you know, I want to know your thoughts on this on the topic. Now, I'll take volunteers for who wants to go first, but obviously somebody with a little more insight on this, having done much more reading on the topic and having some personal experience as well. Michael Leibowitz, what do you think? What <laughs> what the hell is going on in California and what 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 can be done? Well, first of all, it's hard to know if crime is actually rising because oftentimes it, it's about perception. Right. People think it's rising, but then when you dig into the stats, it, it really isn't. But it, th I saw a video and they talked about they had changed some laws. I think it was Prop 47 where they had turned a felony into a misdemeanor. And the argument is that, well, people now know that they're not going to be getting as much time if they commit a crime. To me, th those arguments are always just dumb. Like I've committed a lot of crimes in my life and never in my life that I go commit a crime and say, well, wait a second. I could actually get seven years for this crime. Now. If they would just drop it down to three, it might be like, it, that's not going through your head when you're committing a crime because you're not thinking you're going to get caught. If you thought you're going to get caught, you don't commit the crime unless it's, you know, like you're just a, some suicide mission. But you mentioned something interesting to me. You mentioned Leonard Peikoff's lecture because I actually watched that a, a, maybe a month or two ago. And I was very surprised because the, the two biggest influences on my criminal rehabilitation were Ayn Rand and, you know, through Leonard Peikoff as well. And a guy named Dr. Stanton Salmonow. And I always thought that objectivism yes. in the teachings of Dr. Stanton Salmonow gelled very well. I actually co-authored a book criticizing the prison system based largely on the theories of Ayn Rand and Dr. Stanton Salmonow. Unbeknownst to me, there was a connection. So when I watched Leonard Peikoff's lecture, he starts talking about the way criminals think and criminal thinking errors and victim stance. And I'm thinking, why doesn't he just say Salmonow? I know that's who he's talking about. And lo and behold, he says Dr. Stanton Salmonow. So I was very... Uh, I was, a, I think, vindicated in that I had made the connection independently. I mean, Leonard Peikoff gave that lecture long before I had ever read Ayn Rand or Stanton Salmonow. So that's a, just a long way to say criminal thinking is what causes crime. 
there's people that are going to commit crimes no matter what, no matter what laws you pass, no matter what you do, people are going to commit crimes. And then you have to say, well, what is the effective response? Now, obviously, if you've got a situation where people can shoot somebody and just you know go about their business, that type of thing will get around. I don't know if, if that's what's happening. I highly doubt it. But they talked about lowering the prison population. And to me, that's just a dumb goal. I don't mean it's a dumb goal to have less people in prison, but if you want to lower the prison population, just let everybody out. And you, there you go. What you actually want to do is lower crime. Right. So how do you do uh -huh. that is the question. And I'm very confident, confident that the California prison system is no better than Connecticut's or any other prison system I've ever looked in, in that they don't implement the type of policies that Dr. Stanton Samenow recommended and that Dr. Peekoff endorsed where you actually address the criminal thinking of criminals, you correct those criminal thinking errors, you hold criminals accountable, you don't let them get away with anything. That doesn't happen in prison. I seriously doubt it's happening in California. James could probably speak more to the California prison system, having been a prosecutor in California. That's well, exactly crazy. where I had in mind to go next. James, what do you think? Is it well, getting crazy. worse and what needs to be done? Well, worse compared to what? What people don't, you know, they'll read the conservative news or watch Fox News now. And they'd, if you get, if you just watch that, you'd think that America was burning from a new uh, ferocious increase in uh, crime. Back in the night, in fact, let's look at American history generally. Since our founding, there has been a general decline in crime in general, with certain exceptions. One, the advent of prohibition. When the uh, alcohol was made illegal, we experienced, of course, a sudden rise in the crime rate. We were helping organized crime. We were increasing the related criminal activity to making a black market in alcohol. So there was a huge spike in crime. And the federal government and, you know, the untouchables and the FBI, we all went after because of the crime generated by prohibition. Uh, again, that started to peter off once prohibition uh, was repealed. Uh, but then, of course, they declared war on drugs. And when the war on drugs was uh, initiated, that, too, had an overall increase in uh, actual criminal activity. Uh, if you look at it causally, another spike occurred around that time, too, within the 1960s, as the United States Supreme Court federalized criminal procedure. Finally, the Bill of Rights was applied against the states. You know, your right to a jury trial, your right to a lawyer, your right to remain silent. We got Miranda, we got all kinds of things where the federal government was finally telling California and Connecticut how they had to go about criminal uh, procedure under the US uh, Bill of Rights. That had to be worked out. And again, in the 1970s and 1980s, crime was much higher, much worse than it is today. When I lived in Los Angeles in the 70s, when I lived in New York City in the 1980s, believe me, the crime rate, I, I got the tar beaten out of me in bedford Stuy, Brooklyn, <laughs> when I was a college student there in the 1980s by a bunch of uh, criminals. The crime rate was higher 40 years ago than it is now. Now, has have the in recent years, we've seen, you know, so if you look at the graph, crime has been going down since the 1990s in a secular way over the last mm, 25 years. In the last few years, there se seems to be, and I think I can prove this, Michael, a spike in certain crimes. Um, and that I don't think has anything to do with raising the felony level of uh, theft from $600 to $900 in California. I do not think Prop 47, I agree with Michael there. Uh, uh, uh. On the other hand, what Michael said is very insightful from one standpoint, the criminal standpoint, the criminal does not look at things like, what is the sentence? Has the sentence been just increased by two years? And we'll like, no, 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 that's absurd. The way uh, longer incarceration works to decline crime is by keeping criminals off the streets. The same people, the same small percentage of people do 99% of all the crimes. If those people, if those career criminals can be kept off the streets, you're going to have less crime. And so it was that in the 1990s, early 1990s, there were some radical innovations in criminal law enforcement that did augment criminal penalties. 
That came with some bad things like minimum requirements for nonviolent crimes, like federal minimums for uh, drug offenses. So that, uh, Joe Biden leading the pack, mind you, on, on all that. Uh, that had a negative consequence, in my view. On the other hand, the increased penalties had a positive consequence. So crime declining from the 1990s, say, to a few years ago, uh, I think is in part the result of tougher sentences, mandatory minimums, things of that kind. Uh, it just keeps criminals off the streets longer. So that small minority of criminals simply commits fewer crimes. Now, what has caused it recently? It's DAs. Uh, the DA of, Calif uh, of Los Angeles in California simply will not enforce certain laws. For example, the California legislature passed a law, again, about 30 years ago when we were getting tough on crime, which did cause a, a decline in crime, in my view, at least in part, uh, a use a gun, go to prison law. It's actually uh, about 40 years old. Uh, it mandates uh, that if you use personally use a firearm in the commission of a felony, you got to go to prison. It was the use a gun, go to jail law. Now, the DA in, uh, in L.A., even though the legislature says the prosecutor shall file the allegation, period, and the allegation has mandatory effect on the judge. The DA in LA is ignoring the law, simply won't file those allegations. The other thing is the bail reform stuff. It's this revolving door of jail where criminals go in and come out, come in and go out. And finally, and perhaps the most important cause is our reaction to property crimes. People have a right to use force to take their property back. That includes stores. But stores are no longer willing to do that because of ridiculous uh, civil liability laws and this general moral attitude that no force. And of course, you can't use deadly force just to protect property. You can't use unreasonable force. But can you use force? Can a security guard from the store walk up and say, no, Mr. Uh, stop right there and physically stop them and physically try and take the issue darn right they can. And that's what they're less and less willing to do because of this general moral attitude that no, property is just property, we let them get away with it. Uh, so one is a moral factor that underlies all of this. Another is the fact that we, we have, do have in certain jurisdictions, district attorneys who are acting more like defense attorneys than prosecutors in my view. Well, that makes most of the case there, but I would love to hear, Mark, have you got anything to say, given that you work in California, being, well, I guess you're often in other states, but being a California guy, a Hollywood guy, what do you think about this, Mark? Is, is California crime perceivably getting worse, and what the hell should be done about it? Well, certainly something in California is getting perceivably worse. Uh, the, the homeless crisis is, is truly a crisis that's getting perceivably worse. And part of this, I think, comes down to a, a permissiveness on the part of the people who are supposed to be enforcing the laws who think that, well, crime is a social phenomenon. People are socially determined. They're economically determined. And so we, we can't punish people who are not responsible for their own fates. We have to have sympathy for them. It's altruism that runs through our social uh, context that is making us let these people get away with you know, some some folks who need to be in, in mental hospitals and or, and or incarcerated because they're a danger to other people. Well, no, that's that's our fault. They're they're actually victims of a, of a, of their of their childhood, of society, and they need to be taken care of. We need to cater to them and sacrifice our own needs and wants for their well-being. So it's sacrificial mm -hmm. ethics extraordinaire. I wanted to give a shout out to, to uh, Michael mentioning uh, Stanton Salmon now, because that book, Inside the Criminal Mind, is a must read for anybody who has not, who has not gotten into this and who, who may be um, influenced by the myths of criminality out there, because Stanton had an, inc an incredible rate of, of um, uh, what, what is it, re rejuvenation of, of, of reforming criminals, because he understood that at the base of all criminal behavior was someone's thinking, and that the, a, a, an emotionalistic system, as it was set up, is something that the criminal merely exploits for their own for their own, you know, benefit, and uh, and they never they never grow from it. They just exploit it, and so that's another thing. Emotionalism and altruism seem to be at the heart of of all of this stuff. But I would say that you know, as James said, the you know the 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 no bail, the the revolving door. These are things that criminals do consciously know. You know, I can commit a crime, and I'm just going to be out in, in three hours. So that that's no big deal. 
And I think the fact that these crimes are committed in public, in daylight, brazenly in front of everybody, that says, that says, you know, I mean, Michael, maybe at the time that you were committing crimes, you, you were trying not to get caught. These people don't care if they're caught. They don't care. They're, they're attacking people in broad daylight in front of lots of people. They're stealing things. They go into places with trash bags and fill them up because they know they're not going to be, they're not going to be stopped. And we have the, the recent travesties of security guards attempting to stop these people and getting fired. All because we have this altruist mentality that the criminal is the victim and you have to sacrifice the good for them. Amen, brother. What about that bodega owner in New York? He was being attacked with a deadly weapon by a robber. He uses force and self-defense, and he's the one who goes to Rikers Island. Now, talk yeah. about a morally upside-down world. The, it's the guy who's defending his own property is the guy who's the, uh, sent to Rikers Island for the crime of violence, not the robber in the first place. Now, that is something deeply, deeply perverse, and it comes down to philosophy and social attitudes. It absolutely does. And I do believe that we when I was a prosecutor in the 1990s, prosecutors were keen on prosecuting criminals. We left it for defense attorneys <laughs> to defend criminals. We, In many major jurisdictions, the district attorneys have thrown in that. They're not enforcing laws. They're ignoring mandatory minimums. They're uh, letting people... You see, even a petty theft with a prior, let's say you're under, in Prop 47, under the $900 limit. If it's your second petty theft, that can be charged as a felony. But that is in the discretion of the prosecution. It is the <laughs> discretion of these prosecutors that is become a problem. Yeah. And, and also, I think I think we've sort of internalized that postmodernist idea that um, pathological behaviors just it's just a narrative that's handed down to us from structures of power. I mean, you know, Foucault wasn't he wasn't he big on saying, well, at one time homosexuality was in the DSM uh, DSM as a, as a mental illness. And now it's it's not it's it's all these these are these are ever shifting definitions depending on where you stand in the power hierarchy so we have a tolerance for mental illness even violently mentally ill people that as if we're supposed to tolerate them on subways and metros and public spaces as opposed to defending ourselves against them and i think that's perfectly illustrated by that guy who who that marine like the former marine who choked that um violent violent mentally ill person out and Unfortunately, it resulted in his death, but he was he was protecting people on a train and was seen as the villain for a very long time. Right. We just have to suck it up, you see, uh, because after all, uh, crime is economic is economically determined by poverty. Crime is determined by uh, psychology and upbringing. Crime is determined by this mental illness stuff. And we have to sort of back off and respect that. Moreover, any attempt to uh, preserve your property, you can't use force of any kind even reasonable force when it comes to property. Those attitudes have polluted, uh, I think, our approach uh, to law enforcement. But yeah, Stanton Savinow is an absolute must read. If you haven't read it, folks, definitely read it. No. Yeah, I'm a, I'm actually in the latest uh, version <laughs> inside the criminal oh. mind. <laughs> but oh, I really? want to say, uh, yeah, yeah, R real awesome. quickly, uh, I want to tie in something that both Jim and Mark said. Jim, you mentioned earlier about prohibition and the war on drugs, and that accelerates crime. And Mark mentioned the, the changing definitions and the changing definitions things does has validity to me in this respect is that there's two different types of law. You have malum in se and malum prohibita, right? You have things that are wrong in themselves and things that are illegal just because some authority says so. And when it comes to the changing definitions, what they happen to pass there, that's relevant. If the government just stood to protecting rights and locking people up for violating rights, then it wouldn't have that problem of shifting definitions that comes into play because they just enact laws based on whatever social mores have to happen to be, you know, all the rave at the time. Yeah. Amen, brother. And, you know, the right. thing is, war on drugs is a bloody mess. It is killing people where people don't need to die. The people who die from fentanyl and from heroin are dying because they don't know the purity. They don't know the quality. They don't know the quantity. Uh, it's because it's illegal. That's why people are dying from it. That's why people are dying from it. But more than that, what you're doing is, yeah, I don't know a lot of unemployed teenagers who can afford $800 guns. It is the profit from this, from these illegal activities, that is generating a whole host of other crimes. 
Um, yeah, the, I've always said that the single biggest thing you could do, the single biggest thing from just the law, stamp, uh, law enforcement standpoint to reduce crime would be to legalize drugs. And I, I'm not exaggerating. Agreed. I think we can agree with that. Now, I still want to hear what John and Kirk have to say, but let me just take a moment to give some shout outs here. Thank you to Jonathan Honig, usually a host on the show, but a contributor as well. Thank you for that super sticker. Thank you to Kiana. Kiana Pellegrino says, a very generous super chat contribution, prisoners definitely take advantage of the system. They'll say they found God, but really not all of them do. They use the emotions that come with that to gain sympathy points. You know, indeed, I've actually, you know, that's true. You do have to try and penetrate the lies uh, that someone who's been charged with a crime or is in prison for a crime will often say to mitigate or justify their crime. But I am an atheist. I think it's well known to the world that I'm an atheist. But I have seen people turn around their lives in a moral way using some religion, being converted to Christianity or Islam. It's at the level of philosophy. It is at the level of philosophy that people will change their lives. Now, if they choose religion, I think they're buying into a whole host of other complications that aren't going to serve their life well. But I have, in fact, seen people say, give up drugs or give up a life of crime because they say, found Christianity or found Islam. That's possible. Uh, I have to turn it over to Michael here because he actually found the philosophy and actually adopted and inculcated the philosophy that I think will best serve someone if they're trying to improve their moral character. Uh, but uh, yeah, if it's at the level of philosophy, even religion can have a positive change, at least in some respects, on a person's life. But it's at the level of philosophy that we yes. see these changes. Well, of course, religion can change your philosophy. So can have that impact. I do want to hear more from Michael as well as John and Kirk, but let me shout out Allie. Allie Beard is in the chat, super chat, and says, here in Savannah, Georgia, a lot of places have hygiene products, like basic shampoo locked behind containers. We have a homeless problem, especially downtown. Well, I think the videos coming out of California are showing the same thing. A lot of these thefts, and the reason they're very difficult to stop, let me add to that. trivial items. Yes, Kirk. Let me add to that. So late last year, one of the uh, large grocery store chains in my area, by the way, I live in Los Angeles, California. One uh, of the large grocery store chains near my home uh, started locking up stuff like toothpaste and over-the-counter medicine and deodorants and whatnot. And I remember asking uh, one of the clerks because I needed toothpaste when I was there. And I made a comment about it and he just responded, yeah, you'd be surprised at how easy it is for someone to run off with a hundred dollars worth of toothpaste. I guess that's a real problem that uh, grocery stores in Los Angeles are dealing with. But um, bringing this back to uh, Peikoff's lecture, he uh, I listened to it last night and he said that there are five essentials of criminals. Uh, um, you know, it, he also he said this after saying that. uh most crimes are committed by repeat offenders, career criminals. And he noted uh, five essential characteristics are impulsiveness, anti-intellectuality, resentment against authority, amorality, and feeling of own victimization. And when thinking about this, I was wondering how much of uh, the cultural trends that we see, like a couple of years ago, there was this meme that was going around. It was this comic of this guy who was talking about how he got his bike stolen but I was pretty bummed out about it. But then I think whoever stole it was probably more happy to get it than I am sad to lose it. So whatever. And this sparked a big debate on the Internet about whether or not uh, it can be in some cases moral to steal a bike or whatever. And I wonder how much uh, when we think about like self-victimization, especially in a place like California, where there's a lot of soft on crime policies, but also the cost of living is incredibly high. I imagine, um, I don't know, uh, crime is not my wheelhouse. I'm just throwing this out there to see what people think. In a place like California, where we have soft on crime and we have cultural trends that kind of apologize for criminal behavior, if uh, someone who is uh, already maybe uh, displaying one of the characteristics that Peikoff talks about. If they're more emboldened to commit crimes, if they know the punishment will be not so severe and that the culture will either sympathize with or defend them. Yeah, I, I don't doubt for a minute that even those elements that are not causes are contributors. Yeah, Poverty if, is not the cause of crime. Why, 
Yeah. We have we have statistical evidence which can conclusively show that what what can be a cause of crime is a sense of hopelessness in the face yeah. of economic despair. If you don't think there's any real chance, uh, if you and there are a lot of people who live in America's inner cities, frankly, who are raised with the idea that they don't have a chance. There is no hope. You can't make it on your own. You really are forced into an effect thinking like a criminal because I don't have a rational alternative. Um, that I think can do it, but poverty as such, no. We, yeah, places, I want to make it clear. I wasn't making that case, but I think yeah, in a place I, like California, where the cost of living is incredibly high, if someone already has this kind of like self-victim mentality and this uh, disrespect for authority, if they'd be more emboldened to do crimes than they otherwise would be. Yeah. Yes. And uh, John, did you have something to say about the crime issue? would love to hear your perspective on this. Well, well uh, quite a lot's already been covered. So um, a lot of what I was going to say has already probably been mentioned, but um, I would say that statistics are a big one. I tried to look up some um, some things about just crime in general across the U.S. and uh, California cities don't even make the top 10. And now I it, it's incredibly confusing because uh, most of the uh, statistics and stuff are before 2020. And I think 2020 had a big effect of pushing a lot of people over their edges that may have otherwise been able to cope through normal life. Um, but again, I think this a lot comes down to the government causing these problems, everything from shutting, shutting the economy down to um, the drug war to uh, the like Jane, uh, James and Michael said, um, the lack of uh, punishment from the DAs and stuff like that and not bringing prosecution. But um, I just, I need to know so much more about the statistics to make a good uh, judgment. I, you know, I don't just want to know the number of people that were released from prison, which, or that didn't go to prison. It was apparently 20,000. I, I'm not sure where that number, number exactly came from or how trustworthy it is, but we don't really know, you know, weed or marijuana was legalized as well during this period in California um, or decriminalized. I can't remember which is which oh, one. Legalized. It was legalized. So that that must have had some effect. Um, yeah, it did on mitigating crime. Yeah. But then they haven't completely legalized because I've seen shows where they're still coming after illegal growers and things. And even the illegal growers are saying, you know, uh, they busted me three months ago, but there's another one already that has that area planted full of marijuana in three months. So it's it's kind of like the cartels in Mexico. It's just too lucrative. Um, the government's illegality of it has made it incredibly profitable to do these things. And the you're risk right. is worth it. I the, uh... And you're right about California being better than many other places, places like New York, St. Louis, Chicago, Baltimore, Alabama. Alabama. I much, much worse. Absolutely. But California is one of the places that back in the 90s did get really, really tough on crime. And most of those laws still exist, I would I would uh, uh, point out. Yeah, I've got to say in the chat earlier in the chat, uh, for better or for worse, our, our uh, often a show sponsor, Quint Cordier of Fine Art. Well, Linda Cordier is in the chat and mentions that in Napa, where one of their two locations are, they're starting to see the, the rise in those kinds of uh, crimes of opportunity as well. And then Clint Cordair Fine Artisan with a super chat saying, covered baby strollers, sans baby, are commonly used to steal inventory. Well, it's like walking in with a shopping cart and then being able to walk out with it. Sure. And that that is unfortunate, especially, again, because now you get to see it if you're watching whether it's Fox News or CNN or just YouTube videos, you get to watch those crimes. And it, it is an outrage. It's not, you, you know, the numbers better than I do, James. It's not as if we've suddenly entered the end of the world, but it's bad. It is bad. And I think all the reasons that have been pointed out, of course, Dr. Peikoff's lecture on what to do about crime, somebody asked where that is. Just do a Google search for what to do about crime and you will find that. Um, uh, shows exactly those points. Uh, on Twitter recently, Steven Pinker put up a post about uh, crime and said, well, guns, cars, drugs are major causes. 
I mean, how's that for a completely disconnected list that has nothing to do with anything? I answered him and said, no, dr guns, cars, drugs are symptoms. The U.S. still leads the world in what's best about life on Earth and sometimes what's worse. We don't need a war on drugs. We need a war on irrationalism. And the something for nothing perspective, which our super chatters don't believe in, they certainly want something for something. If you put in a super chat, if you want to support the Ayn Rand Center UK, make more of these conversations happen, by all means, put a few dollars in your comments, make them stand out, bring on your questions with, we have four out of six Californians on the panel, we've got answers for you as well. Now we have a couple other topics, but crime in California, it is you know recent slight up i shouldn't say slight i don't mean to minimize it it is there is a recent upswing i think mark was right to point out that homelessness homelessness is a big part of not just the crime but the picture of what's happening in california and how the irrationalism and he mentioned kind of in passing the the, the free will versus determinism issue so many people are accepting determinism now and say well that's just the way it is as people in these situations, they don't really have free will. They couldn't make other choices. They're completely determined. And that, that to me, and I, th I think, James, you would understand this even better than I would, that's got to be just a killer in trying to get justice in these situations. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, convince the jury, you know, that uh, <clears throat> someone who's just weird isn't uh, uh, out of it altogether. And the sympathy uh, factor that we, you have to uh, fight against uh, is uh, enormous. It really, really is. Uh, and you could see, I think that, uh, let me put it this way, Philo one of the effects of philosophy on our entire culture is the way juries and judges look at criminals. And it will filter the way they look at criminals and has changed radically. Uh, I, I'm not going to advocate some religious uh, conservative viewpoint of morality because that had negative consequences too. But today's, you know, psychological determinist uh, view of, of criminality is uh, equally fraught with all kinds of problems and consequences. Yes. Now, does anybody else have anything else before we move on to the next subject, which I do want to get to? On the issue of crime in California or crime in general, I think I think I think we've really put it out there. Again, folks, if you're looking for more, find that lecture from Leonard Peikoff, as well as, of course, read Inside the Criminal Mind by Dr. Stanton Samano. But with that said, let me jump to the second question, the second topic, the second story, because a recent story has Donald Trump. I can't believe Donald Trump is still a thing. Has Donald Trump and Joe Biden neck and neck if the presidential election were held today? How can that be? I don't know who wants to start with that one. My uh, my perspective is I immediately go to the election betting resources. I go to Predict It or the one that John Stossel is now running. Uh, what was that one called? Ah, but I usually go to predict it. The, the election betting pools right. are never Vegas wrong. Pool. Right. <laughs> he looks at the Vegas pool. Oh, electionbettingodds.com. That's most. John Stossel's. <laughs> yeah. And they've got, uh, let's see, electionbettingodds.com has Biden at 35%, Trump at 29 And at predict, in the, predict It, they've got Biden at 44 and Trump at 31 I don't know who these news polls are that are saying they're neck and neck, but then I look at the socials or the news stories, and yeah, Trump is still a thing. How can this be? What is going on out there? Tribalism. Uh, <laughs> no, go, John. <laughs> I was just gonna say, I think both sides have um, done a remarkable job at convincing their base that the uh, other side is so bad that it's an emergency and that therefore anything goes to divert this emergency and both sides have the same kind of dynamic going on um, with that kind of thing like Trump's claim that um, the new indictment um, is a witch hunt or a Nazi something or another um, you know because why did they wait uh, to till now to bring the charges up well obviously because I'm um, a candidate or running for president but to me, that's just relying on the ignorance of his base in the sense that um, these federal charges 
I think that the prosecutor wanted to go through everything in great detail, which is going to take a long time. And, you know, to say that it's just to get him now is ridiculous. But at the same time, I did see on the news today that uh, someone was asking why they're not charging the five co-conspirators as well with the crimes, um, the <laughs> ones that they've got um, to talk against Trump. And he said, well, probably because uh, he wants to bring these charges up before the election. And if he charged all five of those people, it would greatly complicate the whole thing. And there'd be um, each side would be, you know, each lawyer, because it's mostly lawyers from what I am to understand that are the co-conspirators are going to start fighting each other and uh, pointing fingers. And so that will just slow the whole thing down. And he probably wouldn't get to the charges until after the election. So I do see both. I do see there could be a possibility for game playing, but I have no idea. We don't know the details. It's year. It's, you know, years of things that have come up. So. You know, on the January 6th thing, there is, it is fraught with all sorts of problems. They did not, and this is what I was expecting because the January 6th Congressional Committee had said he was inciting riots. He was inciting the insurrection. Now, that, I think, is a for real crime if someone incites a riot or an insurrection. Um, what they've done here, though, is they've found interesting charges. Normally, if I indict someone as a prosecutor, I start out with my big, fat, juicy fact. This 45-page indictment that I had to slog through yesterday is not like that. And it starts out by saying, well, we don't want to challenge anyone's free speech rights, and then pr proceeds to say, it's what Donald Trump opined that was false and misleading, even though politicians have a free speech right to say false things. So the question will be, and it will go, this is going to go uh, with a bullet to the Supreme Court, is this a First Amendment uh, violation of Donald Trump's? Are they merely prosecuting him for stating his opinion that the election was stolen? Are they merely prosecuting him for saying, see, because they didn't incite, uh, charge him with inciting the violence, inciting the insurrection. So there could be constitutional problems with this one. Uh, in my view, the uh, top secret document case, for example, is a lot stronger. It's clear Donald Trump lied about the documents he had. He lied to federal uh, people asking about it. There, it seems to me, see, I think these indictments are of varying qualities. And I think there is a political motive behind the Justice Department doing them. Hillary Clinton did much worse than Donald Trump on the top secret. She destroyed the evidence. Her server was compromised by foreigners. She was emailing top secret stamp documents left and right, and she smashed her phone. So if Donald Trump is guilty, Hillary Clinton should have been in prison. Uh, eight years ago, I posted a, a, a post about Hillary Clinton predicting this would be bad for equal protection before Donald Trump ever came on the scene. I was saying, if we get let Hillary get away with this, uh, we're going to have problems. And so <laughs> I wouldn't say don't prosecute Trump for that. Prosecute Trump for that, even though Hillary should have herself been prosecuted. It doesn't. But the idea that somehow there's corruption in the Justice Department. Oh, wow. It, I think that's also a, a valid concern. We are becoming more and more like a banana republic where in uh, Joe Biden is now politically prosecuting his uh, most likely oppo uh, a, a political opponent for what he said in part. Now, that's a disturbing thought to me. We're heading down a road of political crimes uh, for what you say and what your opinion is. And if that's the way this indictment is understood, it's very, very, very bad indeed. <clears throat> now, January 6th was a horrible event. I think those who, you know, that was not a good thing. I think Donald Trump was wrong. It, when the Electoral College voted, he should have said, congratulations, uh, President-elect Biden. What Donald Trump did, in my view, was totally wrong, uh, violated American tradition, worse than it had ever been in this respect before. Nonetheless, the way they charged him may present constitutional issues. Um, on the other hand, look at Biden. Biden is clearly on the take for millions of dollars from unknown from foreign interests. That is a no brainer bribery case as it stands right now, in my view. And all of those Democrat politicians saying otherwise, I, I, what planet are they living on? 
is is what I have to say. This is a, a kind of an open and shut based on the facts that we have adduced even to just the last couple of weeks case of the Biden family. I mean, there's no other reason to give millions of dollars to Hunter Biden, much less to nearly every member of the Biden family, <laughs> other than access, other than getting rid of this prosecutor who was investigating Burisma, for example. That is a real case. But then again, uh, it's not, that's not the issue that would decide it for me between Biden and Trump. We live in a world in which most Americans don't want either of them to be the candidates. And yet those are the two out way out and far in, in the polls leading candidates for each party. It's a weird, perverse situation. Uh, I just wanted to add quick or ask you, James, actually, I'm glad you're on. Is the, someone on the news, it was a lawyer talking this morning about the Trump indictment of the January 6th, was saying that it basically comes down to the fact that the prosecution has to prove that Trump actually believed he lost the election. Which Precisely. Be very... It has to be knowingly false about his opinion. Now, was the data overwhelming that he lost in my mind? Yeah. Was he saying something stupid? Yeah. But what the, the state of mind that these prosecutors have to prove against Trump is that he knew he was lying, that the election had not been stolen from him. G good luck trying to prove that in a mind like Trump's, it seems to me. But they have to prove he knew he lost and was saying otherwise. Correct. A couple weeks ago, there was a clip out of a uh, Turning Point USA conference where Megyn Kelly was talking with Charlie Kirk, and Megyn Kelly made a comment about how a lot of uh, people in the Republican Party, a lot of voters would consider themselves Trumplicans over Republicans. And then Charlie Kirk turned to the crowd and said, how many uh, how many of you would that describe? And they, it got a lot of applause. And I think one of the consequences of the Trump presidency was to the extent that the Republican Party was about ideas, I think uh, Trump shifted the Republican Party from a party of ideas to a party of personality. People like uh, Trump because he's Trump, not because of any ideas. They like him because he fights. And I think even after the, uh, yeah, and then we have Robert showing identity politics by uh, Nikos, good book. Um, I think just a lot of people, I, I think Trump ushered in a lot of people into the Republican voter base who just love Trump and will vote for him no matter what. Even if there's a 2022 midterm with disappointing results, people really seem to love this guy for better or worse. And I think that kind of explains. Also, on top of that, I think even tr I was hoping after 2022 that uh, that would signal to the other Republicans like, hey, there's uh, maybe maybe it's time to move on. But even Trump's uh, challengers from within the Republican Party, I think, are pretty weak and pathetic when challenging Trump and his uh, career and his presidency and whatever baggage he brings to the table. Yeah. Have you seen any of the new stuff from DeSantis? It's it's Trump light. It's ridiculous. Oh, it's his uh, economic agenda. If you read the first half, it's like indistinguishable from even Robert Reich or Bernie Sanders. Right. Exactly. Well, and then his first commercial that he comes out with is about Trump being too woke, apparently. I haven't watched it, but I've heard this. And it's like, oh, if that's the direction he's going to go, you may as well just get Trump back in there. You got, right. Trump, you got Trump complaining about DeSantis because he wants entitlement reform in commercials. Trump doesn't know capitalism. You've bit him on the rear end. You've got DeSantis going after private companies because of their political opinions, because we want private companies who are too woke. We want to go over a private company. Now, that's censorship. Neither of these guys would know freedom, rights, or capitalism if it bit them on the tail end. Uh, so we have a party that is lost its ideological moorings, any connection with the founding fathers, whatever lip service they give it. And it's become a cult of personality. My governor over here was a little better on COVID, so he's the guy. Or Donald Trump, there's the cult of Donald Trump. Only he can do things, only he can fix the world because he's the new coming of the Messiah uh, without any real understanding of America, Americanism or individual rights. Uh, yeah. And that's what it's become. Both sides are becoming so tribalistic and so emotionalistic and such cults of personality. And it's not even necessarily the positive one, but the negative one. The other guy's the devil. 
and to do anything to avoid that other satanic figure. <laughs> of course, as both sides get more and more satanic in my mind, <laughs> the other guys are more and more accusing, making that the basis rather than any ideological or policy difference. They're making it a question of who's, who's personally more uh, demonizable. I mean, Trump actually said, I think, something like, I'm not being prosecuted, or I'm being prosecuted for you guys, or I'm going through <laughs> this for you. He said something like that. I can't no, remember. He said, he said uh, th to be clear, they're not indicting me. They're trying to indict you, and I'm just standing yeah. in their way, kind of repeating a line he, uh, throughout his presidency. That Jesus, Republicans are just stupid enough to let Democrats choose their nominee for them, because it seems to me the more they charge Donald Trump, the more the Republicans who are part of the cult Trump are digging in their heels more and more and more. Just because, you know, he is even if some of these prosecutions are politically motivated, that's not a reason to vote someone to be president. <laughs> I mean, I, it's bizarre non non sequitur thinking, of course. Uh, and. Uh, all we have to do is remember all the insane things that Donald Trump said and tweeted when he was president. Before, he, when he was running for president, the first time he said, I could walk down Fifth Avenue in New York and shoot someone and that still get, well, that same attitude is apparently only grown and grown and grown. They, Has they anybody ever seen Brewster's Millions? They, sorry, sorry? sorry, James. Has anyone oh, no. seen Brewster's Millions? I actually saw it for the first time a few months ago. The, original the one with, with um, what's it? Yeah, the, the Richard, because there's an older one from the 1930s, I found yeah. out. But yeah, I watched the Richard yeah. Pryor one. Well, the Richard Pryor one, he's running for mayor, but he doesn't want to win. And he actually has a slogan, go in and vote for none of the above. And a lot of objectivist libertarians, freedom thinking people have the sort of vote for the lesser of two evils mentality. I don't because I don't see how that's ever worked, how it's ever accomplished anything. It just seems to me it's better to not vote at all or write somebody in. I mean, either way, you're not going to get the, the best result you can. But I'm far more in favor of being part of what Albert J. Not called the remnant, the, the people that actually love freedom and when everything falls apart will be there to rebuild. It, it seems to me that the biggest problem here is irrationality and to me, it's far more exemplified right now by the right. Hasn't always been, but right now, these people have just become unhinged. I mean, they just, Trump's a victim, Trump's a victim. It, 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 I remember a time when the right, when you would have a black kid in jail complaining of racism and they'd tell him, buck up, <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it's not racism, take some responsibility. But now all of a sudden, this bill, corrupt billionaire gets indicted and they're talking about a two-tiered justice system. And I'm thinking, geez, I've been hearing guys complain about that for decades. Now yeah. you're talking about the corrupt FBI. But when people were complaining about a racist FBI, oh, no, no, nothing to see here, not in America. You know, I mean, right. just get the, get the hell out of here with that. Right. I actually, the other day, somebody actually called me an ableftivist, by the way. I've heard this. Welcome to the club. <laughs> Welcome to the club. I think it was 25 years ago I was first called an ableftivist. Uh, uh, so uh, you're, you're, you're in good company with me. And but, I am but, with you and none of the above are. Now, there are yeah. cases where... You know, Ayn Rand, for example, in 1972, McGovern versus Nixon, she was anti-Nixon. She hated Nixon. She hated his wage and price controls, right? A moratorium on brains, she called it. She hated the EPA. She hated so many things. The Nixon, she called him a slimy pragmatist over and over. And yet McGovern was so bad, she said, I'm an anti-Nixonite for Nixon. Uh, so I can imagine a contrast being a compared to what, where it's really clear, but I could not vote when it was Hillary versus Trump or Biden versus Trump for president. I couldn't. I couldn't. I think Rand was wrong, James. I think she was wrong. <laughs> I mean, it may not be a popular thing to say. I do. I think she was wrong. I mean, what did it get? Nixon got elected. Did it save the country? Did it do anything? No. He ended yep. up having to resign. He, the country went further and f further toward collectivism. Carter ended up in the White House. I, I just don't see. see that's the test. Do you think McGovern would have been worse than Carter? I don't. Well, there's the flip side to that. Does McGovern get in, put in his socialist policies? Everybody sees how bad they are and you end up with a capitalist reaction. I don't know. I just know that the country has gone further and further down. There was a slight, you know, maybe that Reagan had some pro-capitalist stuff, but he, you know, I, I won't even say some. He had some pretty good ideas, but at the same time, he drove up the debt incredibly. He had the moral majority or the silent majority, whatever they are. They had heavy influence over him. The war on drugs 
Boggs was ramped up. I just don't see that there's been any real candidates that had a chance of winning where it would have been saying, okay, this guy is going to stem the tide and give us a chance to get on a better track. I used to think Goldwater? that could happen. I just don't think so. Goldwater, how about in the 64 case of Goldwater versus uh, LBJ? Well, again, Goldwater, I, I mean, he had some good rhetoric, but ultimately he thought that unions should be subject to antitrust laws. He didn't argue, let's get rid of antitrust laws so they're not hindering business. He said, no, no, let's use the antitrust laws to go against the guys that we don't like. And look once at, you have that mentality, I just think you're done. But look at what LBJ gave us. I mean, he, you know, uh, uh, the war on poverty, the, the, all these vast new Medicare came into being, all kinds sure. of vast new stuff that wouldn't have happened under Goldwater. But you're right. Let's take the third presidential candidate that Ayn Rand voted for, uh, Wendell Wilkie in 1940, when FDR was running for a third unprecedented term for president after being the architect of this new deal. Ayn Rand said, no, we got to bring this FDR guy to a stop. Uh, and she went out and campaigned uh, for an ex-Democrat who was running against uh, uh, FDR in 1940, Wendell Wilkie. Didn't she regret that, though, afterwards? Didn't she regret the support she gave to Wilkie? Well, she kind of qualified, took back her support in very qualified ways from both Goldwater and Wilkie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but I, but I think that, that kind of points to the thing that we have to consider, which is, I could not have guessed in 1972, wage price freeze, Watergate. If if if, there, if if those things hadn't happened, it would be a lot easier to say, well, okay, Nixon was much better than the nightmare McGovern was going to be. It's tempting to say, well, people will learn by a bad president. But have we ever actually seen that work? Has oh. it ever actually played out? Well, so, FDR no, got ahead. elected four times, so. I haven't seen anything work. <laughs> that's yeah, kind of well, my point. So why participate so, if nothing's going to work? Matter, the whole underlying thing is the zeitgeist of the culture. As long as the philosophy of the culture is what it is, we are on a trajectory of um, decline. So yes, yes. the fact that people vote the way they do isn't the primary driver of where our society is going. It's the ideas and the philosophy. So you could argue that politics is only a means of putting the brake pedal on a little bit of certain things, but it's not an end all be all. Even if the best president were elected tomorrow, he wouldn't get anything done because the culture would completely stop him. So, and I mean, we've had, it doesn't matter if it's a Republican or a Democrat, capitalism always gets blamed. You know, they find ways to, to equivocate and twist the things. So I just, if you truly believe that one side is way worse than another, then yes, you probably, if that's your true conviction, then yeah, I don't have a problem with you voting for the lesser of two evils. Um, but at the same time, at this point in time, I don't see how you can see a difference, a fundamental, enough of a fundamental difference anymore. Well, you know, John, you, you you obviously are wrapping it up with exactly the right point, which is culture is dependent on ideas. Ultimately, it comes down to philosophy. And unless somebody has something else they want to say about Trump versus Biden, and again, I believe at this point, Biden is going to slaughter Trump, but everything could change over the next year. We did promise a third topic, and I've got to get into this because it's very sad. Zana de Art, a TikTok influence, this idea of video influencers, famous for being famous was one thing with the Kardashians, but now it's folks who become important to people because of 30 second videos on YouTube or TikTok now. Well, this, this vegan advocate, vegan influencer allegedly died of starvation after subsisting entirely on a diet of exotic fruit from Malaysia. She was 39 years old. Hmm. Sad, yeah, sad story. I don't know if anybody took time to investigate this one. Of course, I'm sure you're all on TikTok, so you already know who this person was, right? I'm on TikTok, but I never heard of her. <laughs> and the story, the link that was sent to me was paywalled, so I wasn't really able to read the story. But uh, I will say when it comes to uh, dieting, I think this is just one more reason why people need to be selfish. I think dieting is an area where it's very contextual, depending on one's circumstances. 
Obviously, health factors will determine what you eat, allergies, diabetes, high cholesterol, lactose intolerance. Some people need to lose weight. Some people need to put on weight. Income and schedule and other uh, things in your life might affect your dieting habits. And I think when it comes to dieting and eating habits, you uh, have to factor in what your circumstance is and which kind of diet will give you the best chances of living a long, enjoyable life and then act accordingly. Well, if I'd known you were going to get it that right, I would have given a spoiler alert before your answer, but you're absolutely right. This was a case, if you got into the news stories, where this, this person was suspected of dying of starvation. Well, it wasn't because she was a vegan. If you look at some of her videos, she was just too skinny. This is some. This is a Karen Carpenter kind of case. The, the girl needed a sandwich. You know, there are, there are notable vegans out there right now. Woody Harrelson. I mean, who doesn't want to be like Woody Harrelson? Olivia Wilde, Joaquin Phoenix, Portia de Rossi, Toby Maguire, Joan Jett of all people is a vegan. Now, veganism, I don't recommend it to anybody, but well, Kurt, I know some Kurt, objectivists who uh, had to switch to a vegan diet and it's worked out very well for them. And I know objectivists she wasn't just a vegan, entirely though. carnivore, not just omnivore, but carnivore diets, and have had great success with it. It, as you say, Kirk, it's individual. It really is individual. I recommend that you listen to show sponsor, not of this episode, but host and sponsor of the Ayn Rand Center UK, Thomas Bisson, you know, with his Body by Bisson program. If you're looking into that, go to Chigwell Personal Training, chigwellpersonaltraining.com. He's got exactly the right approach. He's not going to tell you, here's here's the one thing that's going to work for everybody. Yeah, absolutely exactly. not. I was in Dr. Peacock's car driving to dinner with his current with his girlfriend at the time and my wife at the time and we were talking about what we were going to have for dinner and uh, uh leonard peikoff started talking about these current diet fads like the carnivore versus the vegan versus the and his position his epistem official epistemological position in the car was that we do not know enough it is so complex an issue diet so complex an issue that he is suspicious of any fad diet and he was making Kirk point. He was saying, look, it's an individualized thing. Consult with your doctor. Some people have allergies. Some people have certain intolerances. Some people have certain nutritional needs. Uh, you know, some people, you know, uh, people who have intestinal problems. Some people will say, I'll go on the carnivore diet, eliminating fiber. Oh, my life changed and wonderful. So other people will say, no, I added fiber to my diet. Oh, my life changed and it all got better. So I do believe that this is uh, very, very complex. Now, I think there are some general propositions that we can say. I think we have too many cheap carbs and sugar in our diet, but that's not going to make me eliminate all carbs from my diet. Although I have friends who went pretty car completely carnivore and reported good results. I just don't know if that would be the same for me. And the reason why I'm not a vegan isn't so much as uh, anything else is that I don't hate myself. <laughs> <laughs> I want to enjoy what I eat. Yeah. If you could prove to me that kale would add, you know, a little life to my, if I gave up all the tasty things that I loved, uh, I think I'd give up that year for the tasty stuff. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm not a vegan because I like meat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can completely second that um, perspective as, uh, from my experience as someone with a disability, um, I know how powerful genes are and not that I want to put it all on genetics or anything like that, but just as an example, my disability of the broke, the, uh, weak bones and everything is caused by one gene out of, you know, millions or trillions of genes that was switched off or on. And it's apparently among 28 genes that can cause uh, my disability. So my disability is the is a problem with my body handling collagen, which is a connective tissue within the body, and it happens to be most concentrated in the bones. So the most um, obvious symptom of my condition is the weak bones. But the collagen is all throughout the body, and it has direct and secondary effects on me. Um, it affects my eyes, my heart, and my lungs because of the connective tissue, my muscles. But then secondarily, my bones don't grow enough. So my, but my organs are supposedly supposed to be the size of a normal person, but my bones are not. So that causes all kinds of other problems, including digestive and um, lung problems. In fact, you'd think that um, the number one killer of people with my disability would be like a broken skull or a broken femur or something like that, but it's actually pneumonia because our lungs suffer from the 
uh, the lack of collagen or the improper formation of it. And then on top of it, we, um, we'd break a bone and we'd be laying in bed in, on, uh, it, without motion for long periods of time. And that's a main cause of uh, pneumonia. So just that one gene has spread throughout my life affecting um, all those different aspects. And like I said, it's one out of 28 genes because there's 28 genes involved in collagen formation. So like one gene will take care of, one gene tells the body how it actually coils the protein in the proper way to make the collagen. Other, another gene might say, this is how we get the protein to where it needs to go, or the collagen, I should say, to where it needs to go in the body. And then there's another one that um, is more fundamental maybe that it's the actual building of the proteins or something. So of these 28 genes, any one of them can cause my disability. So within my disability, the range of severity is death at birth to um, the opposite end where you can walk around and not even know you have it till you break your leg when you're 30. So it's just incredibly complex. And then I just think about all the genes involved in nutrition and um, the uptake of minerals and vitamins and all that stuff. And if even one of those is off and you'll never know it, I mean, maybe now we can know with the genetic uh, advancements and things like that, but yeah, um, yeah. most people don't even know if they have a small, tiny issue that's causing all these other things like a cascade effect. No. And as you suggest, it's so complex. It's not even necessarily an on or off kind of thing. No, I think it's extremely personal. Um, and I have to say in that context, our producer has put in the link to a special offer. I mentioned Jaywell Personal Training. If you go to objectiveoffer.jaywellpersonaltraining, there's actually a discount for people who want to work with Thomas Bisson. So definitely use that link if you'd like to save a few dollars. Now, I've got to say Thomas puts so much content out there, his, his video content. If you're following him on Facebook or watching him on YouTube, you can practically get everything he has to offer for free. But working with him, well, I think those of you who've tried diet and exercise programs and found it's a real challenge to do it on your own, working with Thomas Bisson is going to be the way to go if that's your situation. Extremely personal. Context is everything. As John suggests, uh, genetically and, and for other reasons, it's enormously complex. So yeah, I would not read this story about Zana the art passing away from starvation and say, ha ha, therefore veganism bad. I'm going to go have a steak. No, go have a steak anyway. No <laughs> need for you to, to falsely buttress your position in that kind of way. Excuse me hyper veganism i mean she was only eating certain types of fruit she right. said i read the article she didn't even drink water she stopped drinking water oh. several years ago and got all her water from fruit she said it was far better that way and it, she so it just shows the power of ideas in my opinion it's no different yeah. just that claim they can sit there and if you're perfectly still you can stay alive without eating and all this stuff uh, it Fair reminds me Thing, I don't but, want to remain perfectly still. Well, <laughs> and I want to enjoy uh, my lunch. <laughs> Little things like that, you know. It, it, it kind of comes back to the same root cause of all of the topics we've discussed, which is the problem really is irrationality. The refusal to take the facts of reality and your own rational thinking seriously. Well, folks, we've run a little over time, but a great conversation. Another great episode of The Reality Show. And looking forward to doing this all over again tomorrow. Join us tomorrow on the Ayn Rand Center UK at 1230. Up oh, there I go with those Eastern times again, 530 UK time, 1230 on the East Coast for another episode of the Daily Objective to be followed immediately. I'm loving this hour and a half of good, good content. Followed immediately at six o'clock in the UK or one o'clock in the afternoon Eastern time by another episode of the reality show. Gentlemen, thank you. Gentlemen, can I, can I, fest. Me, gentlemen, yeah, thank you for joining yeah, me. Wow, this was a dude party. Can I just get one more ARC plug in? Please. We have an interview with an objectivist magician coming up this week. You will not want to miss the daily objective with a, a French magician and student of philosopher named Owen Christensen. I'll be lucky enough to be doing the interview, but a lot of people think objectivism, magic. No, no, my friends. Only an objectivist can believe in magic, and we'll prove it to you. Because we're the only ones who know what it is. Damn, that's going to be good. 
All right. Thank you for joining. Good premises. Everybody have an outstanding day and we'll do this all again tomorrow. Thank you for joining us.